I didn't know where it was going to lead me. I didn't imagine I'd be going back and doing more Bollywood films, but I remember feeling that this was a very special time for me. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. My name is Talal, and you're listening to the Popcorn and Soda Podcast, the show where we discuss all things movies, pop culture, and so much more. I want to thank each and every one of you for making me a small part of your day. On today's show, we're joined by a very special guest. She is one of the finest creative artists in the industry today. You've seen her on projects such as The L Word, Deep State, and as Elizabeth Russell in the Academy Award-nominated film, Lagan, Once Upon a Time in India. With the movie celebrating its 20th year anniversary, it continues to inspire a whole new generation of creative artists. On the show today, the very talented Rachel Shelley. How are you, Rachel? <laughs> Hi, I'm very well. Thank you. Gosh, what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, thank you for so much for being a guest on the show today, Rachel. How have you been over these last 18 months? We're living in such a crazy world right now, especially in the arts. What are the last yeah. two years look like for you? Yeah, it's been it's been hard, hasn't it? It really has. Um, well, I'm here in London and um, we've had it pretty bad here um, generally as a population. I had COVID a year ago. Um, I, I have a daughter who's 12 now the, and my husband and the three of us all had COVID and didn't leave the house for two weeks, which was very peculiar. Um, but none of us had it badly and we were lucky, we were mainly tired. Um, but everything has become, I'm so reliant on my camera now and Zoom. I mean, I even broke my camera, I think from too much use. I've now got one of those plug-in ones that I've got to put on my laptop. You know, it's everything has gone virtual and creatively, I guess I'm doing a lot of podcasting as well. So. I mean, it's, I'm interested anyway, I was doing some before the lockdown, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a different landscape, isn't it? It really is a very different landscape. Yeah, it really is. Well, it's just to start off, it's good to know that you're doing much better and that you didn't have a severe case of it. I'm happy that your family's all well. That's uh, always a great plus. And yeah, as you mentioned, it's just one of those times where we just have to adapt using the technology that we have at our disposal, right? Like who would have yeah. thought like, two years ago that a platform like Zoom could literally connect the entire world together, workplaces, creatives. It's uh, it's crazy to see how far, even in a crazy pandemic like this, we've kind of adapted, right? Yeah, I mean, it's almost, it's science fiction, really. I was talking to someone <laughs> earlier today, a 60 year old woman, she was telling me her story of when she was 15 and talking about phone boxes and how, you know, there was no internet. And it's so, and now when we think about, we're having a video conference, a video call. I don't even know where you are. Where are you in the world? I don't even know. I'm in Toronto, Canada. Oh, you're in Toronto. So, I mean, yeah. but it's crazy. You could be anywhere. We're talking, we're seeing each other. I mean, it is, it's when I was a kid, this kind of thing would have been, you know, that would have been on Star Wars or, I don't know what what was that other one the Star Trek Star, Star Trek, Trek. Yeah, it's like a yeah, Star, Star Trek. Trek behavior you know a video <laughs> conference call it's crazy yeah it's gonna be funny maybe like 100 years 200 years from now like the people looking back at the things that we're finding so revolutionary and just so amazing they're gonna be like what like yeah. that's ancient yeah. technology it's so that's gonna be a <laughs> fun one to maybe hear about hear about one day Rachel yeah. I'm so fascinated by your story you're having such a great career in this medium, as you mentioned, whether it's podcasting, TV shows, movies, where does this all begin for you? What were some of your early influences and what made you want to be in the creative arts? Oof. Um, I don't know. I think I've always, I've always been interested in stories in one way or another, I suppose. I've, uh, when I was really little, as soon as I could start write and write stories I was writing silly little stories you know and sort of acting them out 
for myself or with my siblings. And, and then my mother used to work in radio actually for a short time she worked something called the BFBS because my dad was in the RAF so the British Forces Broadcasting Service and that was all around the world and she used to work in a radio studio and I used to go in and I used to love it I used to love the smell of those um, sound studios where you open and close the door and they go <laughs> and you can hear the sound of quiet you know that sort of protected sound that they have and you know you're you're not in a sound studio we don't even get to do that a lot when you work in radio now but it was it was great and things like that stories there so I've always sort of been involved in stories whether it's writing telling them in drama being backstage um, in drama and I guess it was just a natural development but weirdly I didn't know anyone in my world who did it as a career, had it as a career. My mum did a bit of radio, but she was very much a sort of background person. She did some performance, but it was small scale. Um, but I didn't know anyone who was an actor. I didn't know anyone mm. who was a writer, who, you know, no one who was in the media at that, at any great level. So it always felt like something impossible that other people did. And yet I kind of had a go because I, thought to myself if I don't have a go I'll never know whether I could have got anywhere and it, it actually when I was younger it took me quite a while before I could comfortably say to someone that I met I'm an actor I'd find I'd be like I'm an, I'm an actor because <laughs> <laughs> I just used to find it too weird that that wasn't a proper job but I've been lucky to be able to say yes that you know that is my that was my chosen path and I've done well. Some, at some points I've, I've been doing better than at other points. And I think that's quite a interesting thing to look back on, to see that progression of when you feel like maybe it's going better, where, you know, the, the peaks and troughs of that and the other creative elements. I've always written, I've always been slightly journalistic, combined the two. So those things are combining quite well at the moment. Yeah, that's really interesting there, Rachel, especially because the answer you gave, it's there's so many similar threads that I hear in there, but so many other creative artists that I've spoken to, especially about that self-doubt or just having that one moment where you go after it. And especially that analogy you used about the peaks and the troughs. In many ways, this entire medium is like a roller coaster, right? You can have the highs yeah. of the highs, lows of the lows, a crazy loop in the middle. Was there when you first started off, did you project that again everything in 2020 in hindsight was it like you felt that it's going to be a linear trajectory or hopefully that's what majority of people think it would be or did you just find that there was just a lot of highs and lows right off the gate lots of highs and lows straight away I'd say um I I went to university in the north of England in Sheffield and I did English and drama and as I was um, in going into my final summer, so immediately after graduating, um, my one of my brothers is a barrister and he has his own law firm. He's nine years older than me. And he asked me to come and work, do a summer of work to see how I liked it. Maybe, you know, I would progress down that pathway. And I was like, yeah. oh, that might be interesting. And then I suddenly got this offer to go to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which you know, I'm sure a lot of listeners will know that. And so I had a bit of a pathway. And of course, I chose the Edinburgh Fringe Festival over being a lawyer for the summer. And, um, you know, that led to things. And you realise that it is these moments, because if that offer maybe hadn't come in to go to the Fringe at that point, maybe I would have gone off and been a barrister. I don't know. So all these little incremental steps and then from there I had connections and I moved to London and I progressed and sometimes I didn't and I remember setting myself uh, sort of deadlines if I haven't achieved whatever it was by in six months time in a year in then I need to refocus I need to because by setting those deadlines for myself I I found it mm stopped it being overwhelming like oh my god right how long am I gonna you know it gave me a deadline if I achieve this by then 
that's fine. Let's not worry about it for now and see where we are on that day and how far I've got and whether I'm still going in the right direction. And so within that, it allowed me to have peaks and troughs within that period, that time frame, and then reassess. Because I think otherwise you can drive yourself mad if you worry about things oh, yeah. all the time. So, yeah. and that worked for me that, you know, I think a few times I got, I got in under my deadline by the skin of my teeth. Like literally, I can remember the day before getting my first, film when I'd given my a, a short film actually but I'd given myself this deadline and I got something the day before and being so freaked out that I just got in <laughs> so yeah peaks and troughs all the way yeah well hey, it's great to hear that you stuck with it and that's the main thing that I think is the sign of a true creative artist or just even in any line of work is you gotta stick with it when you have the highs and the lows because you can go as far as you want in this business and again there's a lot of luck there's a lot of outside forces but if you choose to go crazy over it and obsess over every little thing it could be a very daunting thing so let's deep dive into one of your best roles that Percy one of my all-time favorite roles and that's Elizabeth Russell in Lagan. This is a cinema masterclass, Rachel. Like, not only is the story of this movie so original and unique, the creatives attached with this movie is what makes it shine. There's Amir Khan, Paul Blackthorne, Gracie Singh, director Ashutosh Kawarkar. So let's start at the beginning. How were you introduced to this role? And was it your conventional audition process? Yeah, it was for me a very, well, it was a conventional in some respects. Um, I was sent the script and was a bit confused because my English parts, I was like, I don't understand how am I speaking to these characters who are Indian? All of that was just kind of, well, it doesn't matter. And I started the audition process. It wasn't conventional in as much as they asked me to read a couple of scenes and then choose a song that I liked to lip sync to, <laughs> which was yeah. not something I'd ever done before. And I chose, I know, that it's out there somewhere on the internet, but I don't know how audition tapes get put out there on the internet, but it did. And um, of me doing um, the sound of music and all right. <laughs> yes, it's quite funny. I, cause I'm not a dancer. I, I like to dance, but I, I have no dance training at all. And that's quite clear. So, you know, I, I did a little bit of movement. I had a friend who is a dancer come and just help me, do some things with my hands that I don't know <laughs> and I did it and it went well and I I had a really good feeling about the project and nothing happened initially and I was quite like oh I really felt like I was going to go to India for this I'd only recently come back from my first trip to India on a long travel with some friends and I'd loved it and I had this feeling that I was going back it's really silly because obviously I didn't know anyway so that went away for a little while and then they came back to me um and I can't now remember why or what but I think they had cast someone else maybe they'd cast maybe they'd cast a blonde actress and then Amir Khan had decided he wanted to sort of shift focus a bit so then I had a recall and I had to do it again and after that I got the job and I didn't know anything about Bollywood especially my agent at the time was like, well, you can do this, but you'll never hear, hear about it again. You'll never hear about Lagan again. It's, you know, you're gonna be out of London for three or four months. Do you wanna do that? Because your career is, you know, you're gonna be out of action. And I was like, of course I wanna do it. It's an adventure. It's, it's how could I not do this film? It's months in India doing this amazing, course it's going to be such an experience it's going to be a life experience and that also shows that sometimes you do things for what might appear to be the wrong reasons I yeah, I did them just because I thought what fun what an experience I can't wait if I'd listened to my agent then I think I might not have done it yeah, but that's... wow <laughs> well, that's funny. Actually, the famous last words, right? No yeah, one's going to hear exactly. about this yet. Exactly. It was really famous last words. No, you'll never hear about this again. You know, oh my God, it's nominated for an Oscar. How brilliant. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew? But that just shows that sometimes you choose things 
with your heart instead of your head and usually that stands you in good stead i'd say Definitely. So there seems like there's so many challenges that a project of this size can have. And one of the key elements of the role is that you pretty much have to learn a whole new language for a lot of the scenes. Mm -hmm. So walk me through the process you went through for that, because that's no easy task. It wasn't, but in a way, I had it easier than, for example, Paul Blackthorne, who played my brother, played Andrew, because my character at least had had the ability to sound, no, my character was meant to be learning the language. So I yeah. could sound like someone who didn't know it, someone who was learning, someone who was making mistakes. It was probably maybe quite sweet if I made mistakes and my accent was bad. Whereas Paul, who had so much more Indian dialogue than me, he had to sound like he was really familiar with it and could speak the language. I mean, so much harder for him. So I always felt like I got off quite lightly because I could, they're quite endearing, those little mistakes that I would have, I'm sure, made all the way through. Um, when I heard that I got the role, I realized that the idea, because I was meant to be going traveling actually to Cuba for um, the turn, because it was the turn of the millennium, it was 1999. And I was supposed mm -hmm. to be going to Cuba for a big holiday with a whole bunch of friends. We were gonna go traveling. And I realized I couldn't do that. So I had to cancel that holiday and just kind of knuckle down and work a bit, which is what I did. And I just learned it the best I could, you know, trying to understand what words meant rather than just learning a phrase. Cause I felt I needed right. to, I needed to put the emotion into it. I couldn't just make sounds. I needed to know which beats to hit and, it was tricky. It was tricky. I have to say it was tricky, but I, I embraced it. I embraced the, um, the challenge. You know, I enjoy things like that, something new, learning mm -hmm. something new. And I, I'll always have those tiny bits of Hindi that, you know, that I learned. Well, well hey, I don't know. You, you, <laughs> well, hey, I'll say you knocked it out of the park. Like you can tell exactly Thank you. the way you described it is just perfectly as someone who's learning. And then that's what it came across on screen. And yet you could tell the amount of effort you put in. So now I'm curious about this. What was more difficult, the, uh, the Hindi part or wearing those 1800s Victorian dresses in the scorching <laughs> heat? <laughs> yes, those dresses. Oh, I mean, beautiful. I mean, absolutely yeah. stunning. The costume was amazing. And I really, um, every time I talk about Lagan, I always feel that that, was such an important part of it. The costume designer, Banu Ataya, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, probably not, but she was, remember this is 20 years ago now, she was amazing and so lovely and went out of her way to make sure we were comfortable and to make sure that we looked right, that she did it right. It was really in keeping, really down to the last detail, but it was hot and it was uncomfortable and, but it was fine because it was all part of the experience. I mean, I was, right. yeah, this is 20 years ago. So I was not even 30, I don't think. And, or maybe I was, was I 31? It was amazing. Yeah. It was just part of this amazing experience. I think it, it wasn't practical, of course, to be walking around the desert in these huge dresses, but that's what they did then. And I had yeah. a corset that was made to measure for me in London um, at a quite a big, underwear corsetry place which is i don't know the queen uses them i don't know rigby and pella okay called. yeah and um so i had this corset made to measure and it was when i had it fitted it fitted but because of the way they work corsets they do if you're restricted for long enough your body starts to change shape i also had one bout of uh, sickness being in India I had just one bout but I did lose weight and I sweated a lot of weight away as well and in the end I could move within my corset without <laughs> untying it I could swivel inside it that's how much weight I lost during the time but I think you know it was just it also helped me as an actor with my posture enormously because it makes you stand up incredibly straight and it that gave me the character a lot yeah. of the time that she, that's who she was. She was a very formal Victorian woman. 
Well, there you go, everyone. Uh, you got a fun lesson on corsets on the show today from Rachel <laughs> Shelley herself. Uh, and it's actually, let me just add to that, that when yeah. we did, we did a couple of, when we did the song that I did within yeah. Lagan, there were some scenes where I wasn't wearing a corset, where I was wearing a free flowing dress. It was meant to be like a, a night dress. Um, and when I didn't have the corset on, I did find it quite hard. I didn't feel like I Elizabeth. can imagine. Yeah. Jeez. It, yeah. it felt very, very different. It was quite weird. Quite weird. Hmm. There's so many universal themes in this movie, love, friendship, courage, and it's disguised in the cricket aspect of this movie. Cricket's really embedded in the fabric of British culture. Personally, are you a fan of the sport before the role or even after now? Mm, no, no, I hate to say that, but um, <laughs> you can say it because <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been to cricket. I, my dad used to play a bit of cricket, so I, I like playing, messing about with cricket. My daughter loves cricket. We play quite a lot, <laughs> but no, I wasn't a spectator. You know, I wasn't a fan. I wouldn't sit and watch cricket, but um, it is quite fun. And I know that there's been various things over the years on social media where I've sort of said, oh, yes, I taught the Indian nation how to play cricket or someone else said that. You know, there, <laughs> I can't remember what it was, but there was something about in India about their coach or something. And someone started a Twitter poll who would be a better <laughs> coach, Elizabeth from Lagan or whoever the actual coach was. Quite funny. You know, I don't know enough about cricket. I know that when we were there, all the um, British actors who had brought been brought over, they'd all had to try out at a cricket game and to act as well. But they were cricket mad. They were playing cricket any time that they could. <laughs> like at lunchtime, they were playing cricket. After work, they were playing cricket. All weekend, they played cricket. They didn't stop. Obsessive. Well, yeah, it takes uh, method acting to uh, to literally method acting, right? You just got to keep playing cricket because it's the yeah. main aspect of the movie is they're largely based around that. And yeah. as I mentioned up top, the beauty of this film is really within the ensemble cast. Everyone just makes their characters their own. And one of the core relationships in this movie is that of Elizabeth, yourself, and Bhuvan, who was played by Amir Khan, who also produced the movie. What are your memories of working with such a talent as Amir? Oh, you know... It's really interesting to come to India and not know anything about Bollywood, having to try and give yourself a crash course in Bollywood. I, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know Amit. I knew that he was this huge star. But I think if, you, if it's not embedded in your culture that he's this huge star, obviously you treat everyone with the same amount of respect, but it, it's course, interesting yeah. to sort of see it in action in front of you, other people, the way that, you know, in the first month or so, I remember there were two youngish girls who had hiked across India to where we were staying in Gujarat to meet Amir. And I, I can't, I don't know why I remember this, but there was something, I don't know whether they had gone missing in order to do this. I can't remember oh. exactly, but they were waiting. They'd come a long way just to catch a glimpse of him. And you realize that it was like working with Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt, someone who is, you know, in a collective psyche. Everyone feels they know them. Everyone feels like they're a part of their media watching experience. But it was hard to kind of get up to speed and realize that. But you realize very quickly because. A, everybody loves him. B, he's such a genuine guy. He, you can see why they love him. He did, He was on the bus going in every morning with us all. He wasn't like going in some chauffeur driven car. The support mm -hmm. for him and the love around him was really strong and you could sense that straight away. He was a superstar, but he was also part of the team and willing to get his hands very dirty. You could see how hard he was working because he was producing as well. You understood why he was this huge star. You could tell, you could feel it, even if you didn't know it from your own lived experience, you could tell straight away who he was. He was a strong presence and a great guy to be around, you know? Mm -hmm. 
you know, one of the threads we've been having throughout this conversation is that of Bollywood and kind of the Hollywood and the British industry as well. So what did you find to be the biggest difference when comparing a Bollywood production versus a Hollywood production or a British production? Um, well, there, were, there were so many, I think. <laughs> what stood out to you the most? I always remember how many people, just how many people were involved in a Bollywood production. It's the numbers were huge. Um, we have in Hollywood or UK productions, you have what we call runners, the people who do kind of the smaller jobs. They're usually younger people who are trying to get into the film industry and they're learning from that level right, up. So right. may, maybe they run and get everyone tea. Maybe they, you know, they're handing out new sides when sure, they come out. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. tell, you know, so, but in India, I think I'm right in saying that they seem to be called spot boys. And yet these spot boys were often men in their 40s, 50s and older. And there were so many of them. There would maybe be 15 or 20 of them just hanging around ready to do something. And that just seemed like, well, there's so many people on this set. And I don't know where they all stayed in because it was a small town but they were all there every day maybe some of them were locals I'm not sure but this the scale of of the number of people was was huge I think one of the other things that was quite new then to a Bollywood movie was the sync sound mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm right in saying that Lagan was one of the first sync sound films for Bollywood and I think it was quite interesting. The sound um, guy, Nakul, he, he was constantly having to say to people, no, no, I'm recording. So you have to be quiet, <laughs> um, which people weren't used to because they were used to everything like being. The, yeah, ADR and everything ADR, done afterwards, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think um, my character, especially because she's quite, um, very ladylike a very ladylike victorian mm -hmm. she she didn't raise her voice and she often you know i often would have her have her speaking quite gently and lightly and you could see that like other people go i can't hear her and it would be like <laughs> you don't need to hear me because i'm only talking to that person there you know i'm only talking to him you don't need to hear me but it was confusing for those people who were used to being able to hear hear everyone talking to each other <laughs> you know <laughs> So yeah. that was quite an interesting thing. I remember having quite a few conversations with the Indian actors about that, about, mm -hmm. no, I'm just, I'm just talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's completely different there, right? In terms of just the yeah. movie making process of it and just even specifically how a set is, like, as you just mentioned, there could be so many more extra people there that you wouldn't have in your conventional set in North America or just even in the UK itself. So mm -hmm. I can imagine some of the, adjusting that it probably took to get into the zone and just feeling comfortable in this large environment right mm -hmm. but having said that you know what how many films had I done before that only I'd done a fair amount of television but I'd probably done a handful of films it wasn't like I'd come from you know 20 years of just doing back-to-back -back films yeah. so as and so I was still very much like oh this is what happens oh this is how we do it you know, I, I wasn't so experienced that I knew that things were any different in some ways. Right. It was just Makes another sense. experience. Do you, do you see what mm -hmm. I mean? It was, and also yeah. now I've worked in Canada, I've worked in America, I've worked in France and Germany and different places and they each have their own way of doing things. You know, you work in France, it used to be that at lunchtime, everyone has a glass of wine. <laughs> I was like, I can't do that. I won't be able to say my lines if I'm <laughs> one, one glass of wine and I'll be, but that's what they all used to do. They just used to, it was normal, have some wine. Yeah. It looks like there's different norms in every part of the world, yeah. especially in this medium. Right. So yeah. what would you say is your favorite memory from the entire set and the entire yeah. shoot? Oh gosh, that's hard. I have, yeah. I have Putting images yeah, yeah, but I have images that come into my head always when people say that. And I think probably two. 
the first being I had a lot of very early mornings my <laughs> it's ridiculous but my hair my hair is very thick I had to have it always styled in that in those amazing right, right. looks it's very very time consuming and for the most part I would get on set maybe an hour before other people so I would I would often be driven before anyone else had got up um, me and the hairdresser and the sun would be coming up as we were driving along and I have memories of being in the back of the car half asleep sometimes with my hair <laughs> already in rollers and seeing the sun come up across um Budge, across the flats there and it was just red and the sun coming up and sometimes oh. you'd see the light as as I'm sure you know is just stunning there and you'd sometimes see women walking carrying water um or pots on their head and with their beautiful saris flowing and it was so magical and I would always listen to Tal the soundtrack for the yeah. movie Tal because I loved that and that was my that was a very personal experience because it was just me and the mm -hmm. driver and having an, an enormous um paint fight you know with the powdered paint and throwing paint at yeah, each other yeah. and then water and that was just a glorious end of the day which everyone had been planning and filling up little water bottle little um water balloons in order to throw at each other and just have a, a celebration and let off steam and laugh and that was a beautiful memory too it was just the funniest thing slipping around in the mud <laughs> and the water and the paint it was brilliant mm -hmm. Now, one thing that's changed the most since this movie's come out is the way it's viewed today. Like I watched this on VHS. It's one of the first movies I ever watched remembering. And I just remember the impact it had on me growing up where it's like, whoa, this movie is just so larger than life. Now, mm. with the streaming world we live in today, people continue to rediscover it and discover Lagan for the first time, especially like on a platform like Netflix. How often do you get people coming up to you or tweeting you that they just watched this movie for the first time? Yeah, it happens a lot. It's amazing. It's it's amazing that, you know, like referring back to what we talked about before, you do a, a job and someone says to you, oh, you'll never hear of that again. And then here yeah. we are, you know, last- 20 years later. It, no, it was 20 years later, exactly. 20 so years earlier, later, yeah. this, We had this, uh, uh, a Zoom call with a whole bunch of us, with Amir and Paul and so many people from the cast. I couldn't even see all the tiny little, Giant, pictures. little tiny squares yes, right? yeah, tiny yeah. squares couldn't see everyone everyone was waving and holding up signs <laughs> and it was amazing and you think you know it it has like you say a life it continues and people continue to find it and discover it for themselves I have where was uh just a couple of days ago I was at a fairground and a woman in the queue as we were sort of passing each other queuing up for something just went oh you're in Lagarde. My mum loves you. And she was like, can I get a photo? And it just continues. And you realise that that will always be there because she was 20 oh, yeah. something. Her mum loves it. They've, you know, their family have watched it regularly. It's one of the things they do. And you've, you know, you, I've become unwittingly part of these people's worlds because I'm part of their tradition or whatever else. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. People are still discovering. We have become, the people who, who were involved in the film, have become a sort of family because of that, because we will always be brought back together and reconnected yeah. with these anniversaries and whatever else, it will always be there. And that's that's amazing. I'm very proud of that. Just, you know, it, I'm part of it. I'm not responsible for it, but I, I feel very lucky to have played a role in it. Yeah, I can't throughout what our question it, was. <laughs> I, I'm sure you answered it somewhere along there. I will. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> so <laughs> we have the benefit of hindsight during this conversation, and you mentioned 20 years. That's that's crazy. I'm in my 20s right now, and just like thinking about this, it's like time flies. I'm always mm -hmm. fascinated when I speak to creatives that have been part of these massive films, and I know it's just so hard to answer this question. I'm going to ask, but I'm going to ask anyways. In the moment when you're shooting it. Can you ever really tell what you're doing is something special? Um, I knew it was something special for me 
mm -hmm. think I knew that you know I didn't know where it was going to lead me I didn't imagine I'd be going back and doing more Bollywood films but I remember feeling that this was a, a very special time for me for my experiences I was banking a lot of great memories I was banking a lot of connections with people that will always be there you know if I've run into Paul Blackthorne in Canada, in Vancouver. We were both mm -hmm. shooting there one time and I was there with my husband and my husband had directed Paul in something else many years previously. <laughs> and, you know, you realize that we might not be in touch, we're not sort of firm friends or anything, but your, your lives are sort of woven together with that. And I think we all knew that at the time not just because it was quite a long time that we were there, but it was in some ways difficult. It was hot, people did get ill. It was, you know, a new experience. And the, like I say, the images are, and memories are really strongly banked in my framework. And, you know, we all know memories and experiences change the way right. your brain works. And I think, those pathways through my brain have been set now the Indian connection it is there it's embedded in me it just is in I'm looking around this room there are things that are from Lagan there are pictures there are you know material that I bought in Gujarat um mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 embedded physically in physical items but it's also in my memories and just in my point of view on things so no. Did I think it was going to be getting nominated for an Oscar? No, but I also knew that it would do well in India. So, mm -hmm. you know what, what I love about your answer there, Rachel, is that it's different because I usually don't hear an answer where someone says it's special to me. And I think in this medium, we're always so caught up with the getting the next role or mm. what's next after this, or you're trying to outdo someone else, or you're looking so much externally, it's hard to sometimes internalize certain things and live in the moment and appreciate the things we have in front of us. So I'm really happy for you that you actually got to take this experience because there's a lot of people that I've spoken to who are part of these massive movies or TV shows that they're just, they don't even really can internalize it in the moment that, hey, this is something special or what I'm doing mm. is special because they're so worried mm. about the next job or what's mm. next. So I think that's great. And I think as creative artists, that's something we need to do a lot more, just internalizing things and doing more self-reflecting in the moment rather than looking back at certain things. It's hard though, you know, I think it's being in the moment. <sighs> it's obviously for everyone. It, it's hard. I, I don't, uh, you know, like, easier said than done, right? Yeah, especially now when we're all, you know, our lives and some of our freedoms and ability to travel and so on is so restricted. It is, it's hard not to be a bit like, oh, I can't wait for this pandemic to be over. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to be on the other side of these restrictions. Yeah. But unfortunately, as it's becoming more and more apparent, we don't know when that's going to be. It's very hard to go, yeah. right mm -hmm. now, I'm healthy these people that I love are near me, it's hard to sort of hold on to that, you know, because we want to get to the other side of something. But right. yeah, every, everyone has that, don't they? Everyone finds it hard to be in the moment. So let's shift gears back to Rachel Shelley. What do you like to watch, Rachel? What's some of your favorite movies? What kind of TV shows do you watch? What's something you'll find on your Netflix? Okay. Um, I, I think I watch a whole range of stuff. I mean, it's interesting. I uh, used to say that Moulin Rouge was one of my favorite movies. <laughs> movie. Now yeah. it's a great movie. And I, it's funny because I, um, I remember when I watched that and seeing Nicole Kidman up on top in a red dress sing, and it was all very Bollywood. <laughs> and I was like, hang on, they're copying Lagan there. <laughs> um, but I'm just probably not allowed to say that. That's probably some, but anyway, I remember thinking, wow, that looks like they, Baz Luhrmann right, watched yeah. Lagan. Um, in fact, I know he watched Lagan because he said something about it at one point. I think it's so Baz probably... Luhrmann, right? I believe he's the director of that. Yeah. 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 He's gone yeah. to musicals and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm watching Succession, which I absolutely adore. I think they're all horrible characters, but 
<laughs> I love, I, not that my family is like this, but I have two brothers and a sister. And I think it's hilarious how, when we all get together, we all return to being kids and bicker and <laughs> this, you know, those old connections always reemerge, those old patterns of behavior. Um, I'm also, I am also watching Leftovers, which is a really interesting, strange, it's a bit like Lost, I think. I like that. Okay, yeah. Um, but I also like a lot of British, quite small comedies. Motherland is something that I love. Um, that's, I suppose it speaks to my world a lot at the moment about being a mother in yeah. in London, in the UK. And then I started watching something called Mandy the other night, which is just awful and so funny. Um, you know, those sort of, I don't know whether, you, uh, like The Office, it's got a lot of sure, similar like sort quirky of- Quirky humor. Yeah, yeah, quirky kind of just cringeworthy. You just want to <laughs> cringe and hide your face when you watch it. Um, those kind of things. I'm sure my, my probably my favorite all time TV show is probably Six Feet Under though. One of the great things about being this medium, Rachel, is that there's so many different avenues in connecting with your audience and connecting with any creative as there is. Now you do a podcast of your own. Can you expand a little bit on that and what made you start this podcast? Yeah, so I've been lucky to have set up two podcasts. I set up one that I set up with some of the other actresses from The L Word, um, which is a show that I did in America, which is about lesbian life. And I played a British lesbian, very rich woman. Anyway, I set up a podcast with two of the other actors. That's still going. I'm not attached to that anymore, but I set it up, got it going. And the one I'm doing now is UK based. And that's for a magazine called Diva, which is the world's leading brand. And here's the spiel. It's the leading brand for LGBTQI plus women and non-binary people. So because of doing a, the TV show for five years where I played, you know, a lesbian, I've been embraced by the community here, the queer community. So now I do a podcast for the magazine Diva. I used to write for them. And now, having been on the cover, they asked me to write for them, which I did for many years. And now I'm doing their podcast. So it's called Pod Diva. And it's a, it's weekly, but there are different things. And on a monthly basis, we do something called the Diva Debrief, where we look at the magazine and we discuss the articles. And I interview people much like you're interviewing me now. And I edit them and make little standalone features. And we put that out on a weekly basis. There we go. Everyone listening, Pod Diva. You can find it on all your listening platforms now. As we wrap up with the great Rachel Shelley, it is now time for a segment I call The Final Act. Rachel, I'm going to ask you 10 rapid fire questions about your oh. likes and your dislikes. But here's the catch. We're going to give you one minute to try to get through them all. You up for it? Oh, sure. Of course I'm up for it. Movies or TV shows? TV shows now. Theater or watch at home? Theater. Favorite movie? I'm going to go left field and say Bicycle Thieves. All right. Favorite trilogy? <laughs> colors red, because they have three colors, red, blue, and white. Yes. Sure. One sequel better than the original. Original Annie. Summer or fall? Summer or fall, did you say? Mm -hmm. Summer or fall, yeah. Fall, autumn. Sorry, I just... Autumn. We'll take autumn. that. Autumn. <laughs> <laughs> does, does pineapple belong on pizza? Say again? Does pineapple belong on pizza? Yes, I love it with a bit of ham. Sorry, but yeah. <laughs> all right, first person to ever say that, but all right. Uh, <laughs> fa favorite part about shooting Lagan, in one word. India. And lastly, describe Lagan in one word. Fantastic. 
fan. Beautiful. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. And thank well, you for thank your contributions you. to the creative arts. So my pleasure. And look on to my all time favorite movies. And you play a big part in creating that love I have for that film. What I'm doing today is largely due to films like Lagan. I truly wish you all the best and I look forward to having you back on the show to discuss your next project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tal.